Hello, and welcome to Pin Drop World News, the show where each week we spin the globe, drop a pin on a different country, and take a look at the big issues facing it. I'm AJ Camacho, your host, and on today's show, we'll be bringing you a deep dive into the recent headlines surrounding Poland. We'll be discussing Poland's recent government-changing elections and its role as one of the newest heavy hitters of European foreign policy. Pindrop co-producer Nick Castilla will be speaking with Polish foreign policy and European Union expert Cordelia buchanan Poncha. Afterward, I'll be joining Nick to discuss Poland's recent elections with foreign policy analyst Dr. Julian Waller. Now, let's get into some background about the country's history and politics. Poland is often talked about as the historical victim of its own geography, spending most of the 19th and 20th centuries under the domination of strong neighboring empires, whether that be the Second and Third Reich or the Russian Tsarist Empire and Soviet Union. But Poland's post-communist period has seen the country come into its own. After bottom-up street movements finally ended 40 years of communist rule, Poland established what was broadly considered in the West a model liberal democratic country. In economic terms, this meant becoming the poster child for shock therapy, the fast-paced privatization of industry. Politically, Poland became a member of NATO in 1999 and the European Union in 2004. Today, with a population of nearly 38 million, a GDP of $679 billion, Poland is the fifth largest EU country by population and sixth largest by economic size, and by far the largest by both metrics of the EU's post-communist states. Poland's currency is the Zloty, its capital is Warsaw, and it's one of Europe's most religious Christian countries, with 71% identifying as Roman Catholics and a third being frequent churchgoers, although there are signs these numbers are in decline. And as a bonus fun fact, mushrooms. Now, not this particular type of mushroom. This is modeled off of a poisonous one called Ammonita, but edible mushrooms, rather. The Poles are well known for treating mushroom hunting, foraging out in the woods, sometimes even just off the side of a busy highway, as a national sport. Now, on to today's topics. First, Poland's complex role as one of the new centers of gravity of European foreign policy. Listeners who have kept up with the last few years' news coverage of Poland have likely most often heard Poland discussed in regard to its long-standing ruling party, Law and Justice, often known by its Polish acronym, PIS, which is usually pronounced as PiS. PiS was initially founded in 2001, and in 2015 became the governing party of Poland, the years since have seen a variety of measures taken by PiS that provoked anger and outrage from Western institutions. Critics attacked PiS for stacking the judiciary with loyal party supporters, interfering with media independence, and a variety of highly socially conservative moves, such as a mass restriction of abortion access and the establishment of so-called LGBT free zones in some rural parts of the country. At home, however, Peace remained popular with anti-migrant stances, socially conservative policies that appealed to many in the comparatively rural and conservative country, and a large and generous welfare state. Alongside Hungary, Poland became known as an illiberal black sheep of Europe. The two countries would back each other when facing critiques and attacks from Brussels and vetoed EU resolutions against the other. Then, Russia invaded Ukraine. Poland, a country that had been warning of Russian aggression for years in building up its military in response, found itself not only proven correct, but as close as many EU members could be to the front lines of the war. Poland became the largest recipient of Ukrainian refugees, today hosting 1.6 million supplied military gear to Ukrainian forces, such as fighter jets and Leopard 2 tanks, and alongside its equally Russian hawkish allies in the Baltics, began pushing other European countries to back the Ukrainians to greater degrees. Poland has continued to push other European allies, especially 
Germany to commit more military aid to the Ukrainians, as well as request they sign off to allow German-made Polish weapons to be transferred to Kiev and push the EU to wean its reliance on Russian energy. Poland, long seen as a critique of Western multilateral institutions, was suddenly advocating to expand the EU and NATO to encompass the Ukrainians. Poland has one of the largest militaries in Europe, with its military spending to hit 4% of GDP ahead of most NATO members in Europe. This all hasn't meant that the relationship between Poland and Western institutions changed completely. For instance, the EU began withholding $35 billion in EU funding from Poland in protest of the country's lack of judicial independence. But suddenly, it seemed Western capitals were celebrating Poland and its role in European security. President Biden was suddenly making major addresses from Warsaw, establishing a new U.S. Army garrison in Poland, and pledging a loan of $2 billion in military support. Today, despite a recent significant downtick in Polish-Ukrainian relations under peace, there is wide agreement that Poland is a vital component of the Western security system. Now on to our second issue, recent elections. On October 15th, Poland voted in national elections for the next Shem, the Polish parliament. This election has been widely watched across Europe and America. More liberal observers fretted over the growing right-wing Confederacja party and hoped that the three opposition parties who had pledged to back one another in a coalition government would be able to unseat peace. With 70% voter turnout, it is now clear that peace will not be able to form a government while the three opposition parties, Civic Coalition, Third Way, and New Left, will be able to form a majority. Donald Tusk, the leader of the Civic Coalition Party, will most likely be the next Prime Minister of Poland, a position he previously held from 2007 to 2014. But Tusk, well beloved among many pro-EU observers abroad and at home, is a controversial figure in Poland, and the parties within his coalition span from the center to the left to agrarian interests. But what does all this mean? What are the state of EU-Polish and US-Polish relationships? Is Poland now calling the security policy shots in Europe? And will Poland maintain its pro-Ukraine stances? What has the most recent election meant for both Poland domestically and Europe more broadly? To discuss all of these issues, we now take you to our guest interviews. As a note to our listeners, our first interview on today's podcast took place before the elections were held, and the results were still unclear. Peace was still in power at the time of recording, and much of today's first conversation reflects that. Cordelia Buchanan Pontrick is a Clarendon scholar and doctoral candidate at the University of Oxford, where she specifically researches the political economy of multi-stakeholder extraction. She previously earned a Master's of Philosophy in Russian and East European Studies at Oxford University. In the past, she has held research positions with the U.S. Institute of Peace, the Center for European Policy Analysis, and the Polish Institute of International Affairs. Her areas of expertise include political economy, East European security studies, and the economics of climate policy. She has written a number of pieces on the complexity of Polish foreign policy and security policy. Cordelia buchanan Ponchik, welcome to Pindrop, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much, Nick. It is great to be here. Um, and greetings from a autumnal Warsaw. Uh, it's evening here, and uh, we're all gearing up for the elections, which are going to take place uh, just over two weeks from now on October 15th. Great. Yeah, thank you so much for coming on, given uh, the lateness of, of Warsaw time and uh, for, for you know, starting us off with that, that bit of context. I'm sure everyone is glued to, to the news over there. Uh, I'd like to start off, though, by walking back a little bit. The main topic for our podcast today is Poland's um, uh, increasing but also shifting role within, East, uh, within European security politics and with European, within European politics broadly. Um, so I'd like, for the sake of our listeners, for you to go back a little bit. Uh, and talk about what the situation was vis-a-vis -vis Poland's relationship with Brussels, relationship with the U.S., and within Europe broadly before the war in Ukraine started. A lot of our listeners probably have heard things about 
Europe, uh, about democratic backsliding, about maybe a contentious relationship with Europe broadly. So can you sort of paint a picture for, for us? What, what were things like, you know, before uh, the war in Ukraine drastically changed the situation in Europe? Sure. And I think that some of these, the finer points of my answer, you're going to tease out uh, as we get deeper into the discussion today. Um, but I'll sort of start with a broad overview, which is that in 2015, there was a power shift in Poland. Um, the party then, which is known as PO, then led by Donald Tusk, uh, lost to PIS, peace, uh, who's currently in power. And this was an interesting upset, and it was a rather unexpected one. And one of the ways, actually, that peace managed to gain power was through an interesting conspiracy theory around a plane crash in Smolensk. And this plane crash happened when a group of Polish uh, government officials were headed to Smolensk for, to commemorate uh, the Katyn massacre, which is when um, the Soviet Union killed a great number of Polish officers and soldiers. And the Soviet Union and Russia denied this for years. And then finally, they came out and they said that they were guilty for this. And so this Polish plane, government plane, was headed to go commemorate this. And then the plane crashed. And so you can imagine the sort of two levels. And then what happened after the crash was that Russia did not give back uh, the wreckage material. And Russia claimed that it crashed because of poor weather and poor maneuvering by the pilot. Uh, whereas the Poles claimed, uh, and Peace specifically claimed, uh, that this was due to Russia's fault, and that, again, the same thing was unfolding. And I, I go into the story, I go into this conspiracy theory to give some of the background for the poor relationship between the Peace government and the Russians in a more domestic sense, things that get traction with voters. So Peace and Poles would hold vigils for the victims of this plane crash uh, around the presidential palace every month. And many people would come and, and commemorate the loss. And it's also important to note that uh, the current, one of the current leaders of the peace uh, party, Kaczynski, his brother died in that crash. So this is quite personal for him. And so kind of taking a step back out of that conspiracy theory world, Poland at the same time, you know, even before the power shift in 2015, looked to Russia as a power that wanted to take land grabs. So we had the invasion of Georgia in 2008, when then President Kaczynski actually was one of the European powers, one of the European leaders that flew to Georgia and took a stand against Putin. Uh, then you had Poland tracking what Russia was doing in eastern Ukraine far before the incursion that happened in February 2022. And Poland was minding this border. Then, I mean, consider what's happened in Belarus. And so throughout the years, uh, the peace government has continued to look askance at Russia. And then they were proven right in 2022. And this is a really important thing to note. And again, I think it's something that we'll get into further in our conversations, where up to February 2022, those in Brussels, many different countries, policymakers, perhaps thought that Poland was overreacting to Russia or that Poland was blowing out the narrative or taking things too far. And then Poland was correct. It's also really important to note that there are not huge differences between what was then PO, now KO, uh, Tusk's kind of party, um, and peace towards Russia. This is generally something that is agreed upon in Polish domestic politics and foreign policy politics. Now, one party that I hope that we get to talk about is Confederacja. And this is a fairly uh, far right wing party that has gained a lot of traction in the upcoming election. And Confederacja is not so anti-Russian as perhaps many, uh, the, the two majority parties are. And some of the rhetoric that they've come out with has been quite shocking. And I think that it's forcing uh, peace and now KO to respond to this and respond to this sentiment in Polish politics, domestic politics. And then, of course, that has repercussions in Brussels and D.C. as well. No, great. I, I, I think your answer gets a lot, a lot of, of really important things. I'd add one thing you, you reminded me of when you're speaking about the sort of merger of anti-Russian sentiment and conspiracy theory and, and how these became powerful for PSI or, or peace as, as they're often called. 
was the anti-communist element as well uh, in their in their electoral campaigns. Uh, piece comes out with a whole bunch of anti-communist rhetoric, accusing the current government of, of association with former communists. All of which, you know, most people would argue wasn't really true. But but peace is able to um, you know put forward this rhetoric to associate the current government with something affiliated with the Russians and tap into sort of conspiracy theory at the same time. Uh, I want to talk a little bit more about um, uh, Brussels and Washington, though, because there there you know uh, there have been several uh, between. 2015 and 2022, there had been a number of instances where Brussels actually um, initiated, um, you know, proceedings against Warsaw. The main issue, you know, we, we talk often in the West about democratic backsliding in Russia, one of the, or not in Russia, though we often do talk about democratic backsliding there, uh, democratic backsliding in Poland. The main issue that Brussels was able to hit upon um, effectively was, was court, um, what were courts, the independence of the courts. Um, and, and Washington was also quite critical, uh, and, and media in the United States was also quite critical of, of things, you know, relating to abortion rights in Poland, media independence, all of these things. And yet, with the invasion of Ukraine, we see this shift. Poland becomes a really, really crucial um, uh, country in the broader Western sort of security uh, security uh, system against Russia. So can you talk us through how the war in Ukraine changed these relationships? So it's interesting. I think Brussels, like any capital, has multiple tracks. um, And I'll talk about two of those tracks because there's a sort of political track of optics. And then there's the policy track. And the policy track is sort of the day-to-day grind. And these two can overlap. And of course, they interact. But many times, they actually stay quite separate. And the same is true for Brussels. And as a disclaimer, you know, I've lived abroad in Europe for many, many years, and I still feel like there are many tiny divots to the European Union that remain a mystery to me. It is an opaque but fascinating organization. So I think that with Poland, yes, uh, obviously Poland was called out by the European Union on um, the its actions in the courts and the constitutional tribunal. Um, with the idea that the executive was interfering with the appointment and the uh, how long judges could stay on the bench, um, the appointment of prosecutors that could oversee judges, you know, slowing down the courts, inefficiencies in the courts. They were obviously called to task on the abortion issue as well and on women's rights. They've been called to task on discriminating against minorities, especially sexual minorities. Um, And then, of course, the environmental issues. Poland keeps ending up in front of EU courts um, and getting fines and reprimands for its poor environmental track record. And so many of these were covered in the optics and the politics section. And it was a place for politicians to bludgeon each other and for European policymakers to make large, grand statements and for Poland to make press statements to the contrary. A lot of this went away in the aftermath of Ukraine uh, because it looked like poor form because, first of all, as I mentioned before, Poland was right about Russia. And so Poland felt vindicated in much of what it was doing. Um, And also Poland and the Polish people, they looked so heroic. The optics were very good for Poland because Poland was taking such strong measured strides uh, both against Russia and to help the Ukrainians. The outpouring of refugee relief and support from Polish citizens, uh, I was one of them, Um, well, I'm not a Polish citizen, but rather someone who was helping uh, Ukrainian refugees, and then the Polish government was incredible. And it would have looked terrible to use that moment to then take Warsaw to task again for, um, you know, poor track record in the courts. Now, the policy side didn't stop moving. So if you go into these policy documents coming out of the European Union, the judgments of the courts, they're still being asked to pay these fines. Brussels is still chasing Warsaw over these fines. So I would say that that's still very much moving forward. Uh, It's interesting because thinking of the European Union and some of the similarities with uh, DC, the European Union put forward COVID stimulus money And actually, a lot of that money, that funding remains blocked because of the feuds with Poland. So there are still areas where the European Union policy is using the the practices, the measures that it has to make Poland feel that pain. And you just don't see it as much. 
Um, now, I think something that we're going to get into, so I don't want to go on about it too much, is how that might have changed in the past uh, week or so with some of the rhetoric that's coming out of Warsaw right now. But the note that I'll end on is that there's a very real discussion going on in the policy spheres on whether the center of gravity in Europe is shifting from Brussels to Warsaw because of the importance of the military and the security arrangements, um, especially uh, with Finland and then eventually Sweden joining NATO. They have a lot more in common on the military side with Poland's previous military buildup and capabilities than German or French or obviously Belgian. There is no EU army, right? And so there's a very, very large discussion about then how much is this military side at odds with the policy and bureaucratic side of Brussels? I, I want to maybe explore the European dynamics a little bit more before we get back to Poland in and of itself. You're talking about there's this conflict between the military side of what's going on in the European Union, where there's a lot of weight in the East, uh, Poland and the Balts and, and Finland maybe as well now, versus the political side in the West, France and Germany. There's a lot of rhetoric about um, you know an emerging uh, the, the emerging political power of parties and actors within countries like France and Germany who are not as hawkish on, on Ukraine and on Russia issues. And that contrasts really heavily for the most part, though we can get into maybe some, some shifts there, with what's going on in Poland and the Balts and East Europe. Um, your read of the European Union, especially with elections coming up in Germany, do you think that tension is going to get a lot more severe in the near future? Do you think that's a, that's a big risk to EU-wide security policy? So this is a difficult question to answer without mentioning Poland. Um, <laughs> I know you wanted me to focus on Pol uh, on no. kind of the EU side, but Please, I, feel free to I talk think about Poland. Uh, so the short answer is obviously, yes, this remains a real risk. Um, it was incredible what the European Union was able to pull together uh, in terms of sanctions, but it was not easy and it required significant uh, concessions, significant discussions, and it required that the European Union and its members decide that this is the direction that the bloc wants to take, and that this sort of direction was worth the economic costs to its individual member states. I mean, one of the interesting things about the European Union that I consistently underrate myself, so I think it's worth pointing out to the listeners, is that it requires that the member states agree. And it also requires, because we're talking about individual sovereign states, and beyond that, it requires that the individual member states don't do things to harm other member states. And so this leads to a very slow process, but it also leads to a process that has a lot of integrity when it does come forward with something. And so obviously, uh, from the outset, there have been countries and then political parties within those countries that have not seen the way uh, the security situation, the way that those on the eastern side do, those in the Baltics, Poland, obviously, even a country like Finland, uh, the way that they would see the security situation. And in February and March 2022, it was so apparent that this something had to be done rapidly that it was easy is not the word, but it was possible to pull together all of the member states and agree on sanctions and apply political pressure, political pressure to ensure that countries generally were giving military or other type of aid. That is no longer certain. In fact, it's a lot, large amount of doubt has been cast on it. And then let's now bring in the Poland aspect and bring in these comments where the Polish government, uh, you know, Polish leaders, Polish prime ministers, the Polish prime minister is saying that Poland, who has been one of the, the most stalwart allies, allies of Ukraine from the beginning, uh, they are going to withdraw military aid. And then beyond that, you, know, you have President Duda likening Ukraine to a drowning person, saying that you are at risk of being pulled down as well. 
And then you have Polish politicians even discussing pulling aid away from refugees. Wow, shocking. And there are domestic reasons for this, which we're about to get into, I think. But the point is that you know, even with the domestic reasons aside, what Poland is showing is that aid to Ukraine is not unconditional. It's very much conditional, and it can be used as a political tool, even within a country that has been a huge ally to Ukraine. So what message is that sending to those in Germany, in France? I mean, we have EU elections next year. It's just this is sending a strong message that things are unraveling. And beyond the European Union, this is also sending a message to Washington, D.C. The U.S. also has presidential elections next year. And while no president would, no president would probably pull U.S. out of NATO, but what a U.S. president could do is begin to draw down support for Ukraine. And it could do that by pointing to Europe and saying, you're not giving enough support to Ukraine. Why should we fund this war? And again, pointing back to this rhetoric. And then finally, obviously, this is sending a message to those in the Kremlin. It's showing how this can, it's showing weaknesses, it's showing faults, it's showing cracks. Uh, so obviously, even though we talk about this shift towards, you know, Warsaw or, you know, the importance of the military buildup, comments like this do throw a lot of that um, into deep relief and deep contrast. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think you're right when you talk about, you know, Poland introducing a conditional or a more conditional aspect to the aid going to Ukraine. It could spur something more in, in Germany or France. Expanding on that scenario a little bit, let's say, um, you know, elections in, in Germany go a particular way. Let's say there's a big right wing or populist victory in, in Germany. Um, and maybe things in Poland, you know, um, smooth over vis-a-vis -vis their relationships with Ukraine. Do you think we could end up in a situation, you know, one or two years from now where countries like Germany or, or maybe even France as well are, are really resistant to, to giving further aid to Ukraine, but countries like Poland or, or the Baltic states continue to, to supply a, aid to Ukraine? What do you think the, the possibilities are of that? Do you, do you think some, a scenario like that is even possible or are there mechanisms within the EU and, and other um, you know, uh, institutions that could stop that kind of disjointed response from different actors in the European Union? I think that the situation is unlikely, but I don't think that the pressure would come from the European Union because that's not its job. I think it's much more likely that the pressure would come from the United States. I think that U.S. policymakers and diplomats have been working tirelessly to ensure that we have our NATO allies and partners on board when we are acting in unison to help Ukraine and to counter Russia. And I think pressure like that is important. And I, I think, you know, maybe proving you right, just recently we, we had the announcement of $2 billion in, uh, uh, in a loan uh, from the United States to Poland. Uh, in order for them to upgrade their military away from sort of communist era uh, stuff towards really cutting edge technology. I think that's going to give the United States a, a lot of leverage, maybe more so than even uh, Brussels in, in Poland in years to come. I want to get at something a little more um, ideational, though. In places like Ukraine, and this is also the case absolutely in Georgia, most of the rhetoric you hear and most of the framing you hear isn't just we're anti-Russia, isn't just even we're pro ourselves, we're not just nationalists, we're pro-West, right? When you talk to Ukrainians and Georgians, they don't only just talk about their own territorial integrity. It's part of a broader vision. You know, we as Ukrainians are Western. We should be with the West. We should be with the European Union. The only reason our place in Europe has ever even been questioned is because of Russia as an outside actor sort of drawing us eastward. Do you, do you get this sentiment in Poland as well? Because while Poland has been super hawkish on Russia, um, the preceding years uh, has seen a lot of... Um, developments that made people in the West question, you know, uh, are these countries like Poland and then Hungary is always grouped in with Poland. Are these countries really pro-Western? They, they, you know, they're, they're talking about ethnic nationalism. They're talking about Poland as a Catholic country. And that would contradict some people's conception of what exactly, you know, the, the modern liberal West is. When you, when you talk to, to people in Polish government and in, in Polish society, do you hear the, the pro-Western rhetoric of the kind you hear from Ukrainians and Georgians? Or is there something more, more nationalistic, something a little different? 
It's an interesting question, and it obviously has a difficult to answer philosophical premise because, of course, it begs what is the West? Yes. And how much can we define what the West is through norms and shared values and you know ideas of what creates a nation? Um, I think if you talk to Georgians, for example, they obviously have a deep-rooted sense of what it is to be a Georgian as opposed to an Armenian. But it doesn't necessarily make them anti-West. And so I think that first... Right now, at least, in rhetoric, I think there is something uh, essential about being pro-West that necessitates being anti-Russian. And I think within that is the idea of people, peoples within a country uh, choosing the path that they wish to take. And the reason this gets slippery, slippery, slippery philosophically is because probably if we sat down and had a conversation with someone like Orban or someone like Kaczynski, they would even argue that they are espousing perhaps the most of Western values precisely by embodying or allowing Hungarians or Poles to embody their deepest sense of self and that nothing is more pro-West than that. But we'll set that aside for a moment uh, because I don't need... Uh, well, too many Hungarians and Poles banging on my door tomorrow. Uh, but I think in Poland, there are definitely, there is definitely a sense that what Poland is doing is in line with the West and is defending something larger, some larger idea, some larger premise, some progress towards a defined goal um, that is modern that is flexible, that is um, you know, peaceful. And this is important both at the government level, but also at the individual Polish level. And I think here, something that I want to point out is, well, first that Poland is literally the border of the European Union. It houses Frontex, which is the European Union's border agency. It's probably the closest thing that European Union has to a military. Uh, and also, Poland is a far border of the European Union. And that border has gotten a lot bigger recently. So pre, you know, when Peo was in power, basically we had Kaliningrad. Well, now we have Kaliningrad, we have Belarus as essentially a vassal state. Um, and then we have the border with Ukraine, which Ukraine itself is a friendly nation, but because Ukraine is at war with Russia, that border is a risky border, right? It's no longer non-porous. And Poland has to defend this. And Poland also has to serve as now the Far East capital for refugees, political refugees, asylum seekers from these countries. So Poland right now has not just Ukrainian refugees, but it also has people from Belarus. It has dissidents and writers. It has journalists who had to flee Moscow. And those people are integrating. They're part of the community in Warsaw and beyond. And I think that that has a really powerful effect on the way that Poles and people in Warsaw and people throughout Poland see the country's role in addressing Russia's increasingly authoritarian moves in, you know, in these places on its border zone. I, I want to pivot, you know, sort of to a last couple questions really focused on the most recent headlines and also on Polish domestic politics as well. Uh, so we, we actually, we, uh, we planned this interview out before this story really developed, but one of the biggest headlines around Poland uh, in the last few days has been this really uh, drastically increasing disagreement over grain shipments uh, from Ukraine, whether or not they should be allowed into countries like Poland, um, you know, with, with uh, the Ukrainian government really taking issue with the Polish government not allowing this, and then a, a series of increasingly um, you know, in, sort of inflammatory statements, one could say, uh, you know, most recently, the, the Polish prime minister stated that no new weapons were going to be delivered to Ukraine from Poland so that Poland could, uh, you know, re, uh, reestablish its own military capacity. You know, the, the president, uh, Duda, sort of walked those comments back a little bit. And then we saw, you know, the, even more recently, the announcements of $2 billion in loans from the U.S. to the Polish military, which sort of hints that maybe uh, this, this episode calming down a little bit. 
Uh, what's your, your read on this episode? Do you, do you think it's going to develop more drastically? Do you think that at the end of the day, Poland has already invested so much in Ukraine as a security partner and is so interested in uh, a Ukrainian victory in the war that this won't really matter in the grand scheme of things? Or what, what's your reaction? Hmm. I think when it, I mean, obviously Poland is extraordinarily invested in Ukraine winning the war, not just because it sees Ukraine as a strategic partner, but also because it's eyeing its own borders and it's eyeing uh, Russian troops coming closer to the Polish, the Polish state. Um, and this is very important for policymakers in Warsaw. I think we were discussing at the outset the elections, and it's really unfortunate. Um, I do think that a number of these comments and the nature of the comments are happening because this is an election year. Um, and I'll give two examples why. So earlier I mentioned the political party Confederatia. And so now I'm going to take maybe a small step back and go into a bit of Polish politics. Um, so really? parliamentary elections are going to be held on October 15th. And this is for Poland's same, which has an upper and lower house. So the same and the Senate. And it is highly likely that peace will get about 33% of the vote. Um, and then the second coalition, which is uh, includes the KO and two civic platform party will get sort of the second place. Uh, and then a bundle of other parties will sort of fall into third and fourth place. But it's likely that actually no coalition will have an outright majority within the legislature. And because of this, um, a coalition will have to be formed. And again, it's likely that Duda will go ahead and give Peace's coalition the green light to try to form a government. And in doing so, uh, peace might turn to Confederatia. And Confederatia is a grouping of parties that have tended to be quite right, uh, quite to the, the right of the spectrum. And they've made some really inflammatory comments about Ukrainian refugees, about the aid that's being given to Ukraine, about uh, Jewish people, about abortion, and so when PiS's current leadership is making these statements, um, they might be trying to do two things. Uh, the first is that they might be trying to prevent voters from going over to Confederatia who would normally align with peace. We don't really have this in the United States because we have really only two parties. But think about, uh, for example, in the 2016 election when there was a bit of a split within the Democratic voting because of Sanders and Clinton. Or think about the Tea Party elections when uh, Tea Party candidates were taking away votes from traditional Republican candidates. This might actually even happen in the upcoming elections in the United States where you have a spoiler that then takes away votes from the primary candidate. And one way to prevent that from happening is to begin to adopt the language of the spoiler. So it's possible that what peace is trying to do is trying to adopt some of the language of Confederatia in order to draw in those voters and get more of a majority for itself. The second thing that peace might be trying to do, uh, in addition to the first really, is to begin to court Confederatia as a coalition partner. Because when you're trying to form this government, uh, when you go to the negotiation table, you want to have certain things that you seemingly agree on or align on. And this is one way of doing it. So that's the first. The second um, is on the grain issue. I'm not going to get into the detailed uh, trade economics of this, but it's not so big of a trade export issue as one might believe. The numbers aren't massive. But to tell this to Polish farmers during an election year when a stronghold of peace voters is in rural farming areas is unwise. And so it would be, since Brussels has um, sort of scaled down and refused uh, to continue the blockade, it would be foolish from a political point of view 
for peace not to take a stance on this because it would look like they're saying it's okay and Polish farmers wouldn't necessarily go into the intricacies of this. It would just be bad political optics. And so, of course, a stance has to be taken. Uh, so there's clear politics at play here, and we might see a lot of this scaled back even more after the election takes place. But I return to my earlier comment, which is that even if you cannot unring this bell, once these things are taken off the table, if they are, and I think they will be, um, it has still shown policymakers in other countries and other capitals how conditional these things are, how conditional this support is, and that there will be a price to pay for that, I think. Well, and it's, it's rather unnerving, and maybe uh, rightly so for anyone who tries to make predictions about international relations, that that bell was rung by a country that w was seen to be you know, the most stalwart supporter of, of the Ukrainians. Precisely. Yes, it's it's deeply unfortunate. So I think we'll leave it there. Cordelia Buchanan Ponchik, thank you so much for joining us today. The conversation that you're about to hear discusses the October Polish parliamentary elections, and it takes place between myself, my co-producer Nicholas Castillo, and Dr. Julian Waller. Professor Waller is a professional lecturer in political science at George Washington University, lecturing on contemporary Russian politics. His research focuses on a variety of related issues, such as the comparative politics of Russia and the post-Soviet region, military and strategic studies, comparative authoritarianism, and illiberal politics and dynamics. In addition to lecturing, Professor Waller is a non-resident fellow at the Illiberalism Studies Program at the Elliott School of International Affairs, and an associate research analyst in the Russia Studies Program at the Center for Naval Analyses, a federally funded research and development center specializing in national security and political military analysis. His work has appeared in a variety of publications and in peer review journals, including the Journal of International Affairs, Political Studies Review, Problems of Post-Communism, the Journal of Illiberalism Studies, Social Media and Society, in the International Journal of Constitutional Law. Professor Waller, welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I'd like to start off with a discussion of the uh, immediate results of the election. Uh, for the sake of our listeners, on October 15th, there were national elections in Poland. The result is that the opposition parties will likely be able to form a government and oust the long-sitting Law and Justice Party. Um, the results of the election with 70% turnout were 157 seats awarded to Donald Tusk's Civil Coalition Party. 26 to the left party, and 65 to the third way party. Now, the Law and Justice Party itself received 194 seats, making it the largest in the parliament. But given that the three opposition parties have pledged to back a unity government together, the most likely uh, option in the coming days and weeks is the formation of, of a new government in Poland. Uh, just to get straight into it, uh, Professor Waller, what's your read of the election? What do you think was the driving force behind the opposition victory? Well, thanks for having me on. Um, the election was widely watched uh, in the scholarly community, first the policymaking community. The EU was very interested in it as well. Uh, we'll probably talk a little bit later about exactly why that's the case, but Poland has been on many people's minds. Um, when we think about uh, Eastern European politics, when we think about politics in modern democracies, as well as questions associated with the Russo-Ukrainian war as well. In terms of the election itself, uh, the op as you said, as you said, the opposition won notably, but we have to be a little bit careful about it because it was a rather diffuse victory. Uh, a very, very clear majority, if we add up all the seats across three coalitions of parties, uh, right? So each each one of the opposition victory uh, victorious groups are actually coalitions of multiple parties. Uh, so we have a rather large and complicated same that's going to be formed. Uh, eventually. Uh, one reason for the success, of course, is that the opposition ran uh, a good campaign. Um, we don't have to put everything in existential terms. We can also understand Poland as a, a product of an electoral democracy in which uh, parties do actually compete uh, on uh, values and policies and issues and personalities. And the opposition happened to uh, have the better. And it also happened to be able to push against uh, fatigue. Uh, incumbency fatigue of peace. Um, so that's that's part of it. The opposition ran a good campaign. It was coordinated, well-coordinated. 
uh, and focused on a few key issues, key issues regarding uh, discontent and disagreement with peace, uh, law and justice, uh, the, the previous ruling party. Uh, one of the primary uh, opposition components was, in fact, discontented former allies of law and justice. That's the th sort of third way contingent, which uh, combined an agrarian element with sort of a kind of a personalist vehicle, uh, both of which represented more conservative voters, a more conservative policy platform, and had previously been at least partially aligned uh, with the ruling party in previous iterations. Uh, ha with that primary defection, it enabled a broader coalition to be formed. Uh, additionally, uh, you mentioned the left party as well, which did not actually do very well in this election. It's part of the coalition. It, 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 it decreased its seats. Uh, as a result, you have a very, very uh, wide band of opinion um, formed across this uh, governing coalition to be, which is a great benefit in a proportional representation electoral system. So that, again, helped the opposition win. You're spreading across a tremendous amount of different political values, uh, different demographic groups, regional groups, and so on. Uh, and it's just going to be a bit more challenging when we get to forming the government. Yeah, that I, th there's been so much excitement in the West about these results. Um, but at the same time, I, you know, in doing my reading for this episode, I came across a piece in uh, Foreign Policy by Yaroslav Kutsa and Karolina Wigura, names of which I'm both, I'm sure I'm pronouncing terribly. Um, but the, the point they make in their piece in foreign policy is that there's actually quite a tall order for this coalition, right? Not only in terms of internal cohesion, but also working within a government that for eight years has really sort of been set up and staffed by, um, by peace uh, loyalists. Do you foresee that being a big problem for, for this incoming government? Yes, it's going to be a big problem in a, across a variety of dimensions. And that's, that's actually part of the issue is that Western observers are really keyed into sort of macro level issues in the election. So regarding democracy and uh, law and justices, uh, institutional aggression uh, regarding, let's say, uh, the judicial system um, and other elements of uh, Polish political institutions uh, and the government support of them, uh, the media apparatus as well. And so there's all this, this stuff at the macro level, at the, 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 the bigger picture that Western scholars are interested in, many Polish opposition-oriented uh, academics are also interested, big, big ticket items. The problem is, is that many voters don't care about those sorts of things. They voted against peace for different reasons, uh, or they were always going to vote against law and justice, right? So like the left, for example, doesn't, may or may not care about all of these various democracy level issues, but you're still going to vote for a left party, right? Um, or if you're in the more conservative agrarian anti-peace uh, element of the coalition, maybe you care about the democracy side of things. Maybe you care about other stuff. Maybe you care about corruption, any corruption, or you care about uh, scandals that have sort of beset the government. So again, we have to keep, keep all that in mind because there's lots of reasons why it's going to be complicated. I talked a bit about the, just the mechanical nature of the coalition being very, very unwieldy in principle. Uh, there's something that uh, we also often forget uh, when we talk about Polish politics, is that Donald Tusk, who is essentially the likely prime minister designate, likely the formateur uh, of the governing coalition after the president asks peace to form a government and fails, Donald Tusk is, has a very, very strong reputation in Poland in a divisive manner. Many people do not like him. Many people in the opposition do not like him. Um, and for a variety of reasons, some of which are just sort of his brand. Uh, some of it is his previous experience as prime minister. Uh, some of it is the way peace has always framed him as being especially pro-German. Um, and some of it's just his personality, uh, which is, again, very, very strong. So there's a reason why he's popular. There's a reason why he's also unpopular. That's going to cause complications because his party did not win fully outright relative to the, his other coalition partners. And then you have what you were referring to and alluding to before, which is the institutional changes that people are really interested in seeing. They really want to see a change to the uh, state media, uh, the state broadcaster, right? Uh, they want to see a change towards how the government subsidizes regional newspapers. They want to see uh, a very complicated sort of solution, potentially like a illustration effort against law and justice appointed judges and the Judicial Council that, again, sort of appoints the judges and oversees them, uh, 
all of that is going to be tremendously tricky, even if even if you agree with every, every single aspect of it. There needs to be a, a root and branch change to all elements of the, of the government, uh, all of the institutional uh, mechanisms that peace touched over the last several years um, since they first uh, came into office. Uh, all of those are tricky unto themselves. And then given a disparate coalition, that's going to be very, very generally troublesome. <laughs> Professor Waller, I want to, you mentioned Donald Tusk, the presumptive next prime minister. Um, look, he's been in a lot of leadership positions before, president of the European Council, so forth and so forth. But as you mentioned, he has a lot of controversies around him. I want to get your thoughts specifically on the investigation that, as of now, is still ongoing into him. Of course, Tusk himself said that it was launched with influence from the Kremlin. Uh, it happened to be launched the same year there was an election. A lot of suspicion could be alleged there. But the allegations are that he forced an investigation of a Polish businessman and his company for importing Russian coal. That uh, businessman ended up getting jail time. From your perspective, do these appear to be completely trumped up charges, or does there appear to be an element of potential uh, legal justification in this investigation? It's a tricky question in part because we're not privy to all the facts. Um, and again, that's what a legal investigation is supposed to uncover. Um, it's also uh, difficult due to the highly polarized nature of Polish politics and also reporting on Polish politics. Um, I think it's probably fair to say if you're going to take, let's say, let's say an outside observer approach um, and, uh, like as Americans or as someone in the West who is not Polish, tries to be a little bit distant from it, um, it's very difficult to just assume that uh, either Donald Tusk or uh, overall the PO, which is his primary party, which once uh, ruled Poland prior to peace, uh, are squeaky clean on a variety of issues. This is, it's very unlikely that that's the case. Um, and traditionally, uh, the PO has been accused of being uh, very, very close to Germany and generally close to Russia, relatively speaking. Now, that was a number of years ago. So part of the problem with the current accusations surrounding this whole issue around Donald Tusk and others uh, related to Russia is that it's, it's, it's a long time ago. In many ways, it's a completely ge different geopolitical environment. So uh, regardless of whether or not uh, he or someone close to him uh, is perhaps guilty of these charges, this is in a very, very different environment, um, such that it would be unfair to then target him and say, oh, you're a pro-Russian today, right? Which is kind of the implication. Um, that's, pro that's not where we want to be uh, necessarily. That, that, that doesn't really fit. I mean, one could say that the Democratic Party of the United States was pro-Russian, given the Obama reset uh, happening over 10 years ago, right? That's not a super useful claim to be made. It's, that's more partisan points than it is actually helping us understand sort of the here and the now. Um, so we should understand at least some of the chatter on that investigation to be politically motivated and attempt to tag. At the same time, it's probably if we're interested in the actual reality surrounding it it's probably not worth throwing out per se um there's likely at least something there um kind of a complicated answer right. uh, one problem with the way that we tend to talk about polish politics in the west is we get involved in the political sides um quite easily and when you read reporting from the new york times or the washington post or like the economist or something like that you can kind of forget that, you know, you're not Polish, actually. And the, they, they have their own internal complicated politics that it's not always tremendously useful to just pick a partisan side and be pro. Um, you, that might be beneficial to you. That's fine. Um, but oftentimes you end up missing quite a lot. And then you end up being blindsided by the fact that uh, Polish politics is not the cleanest in the world, for example. Uh, Professor Waller, I think with our time constraints, it would be a good time to move on to that international X aspect we've been alluding to, particularly with regard to the EU. It, it seems to me for years now, the English speaking media, um, non-Polish media has kind of built the idea that Tusk would become elected at some point as a cure-all for Polish EU relations. I, I have sort of a two-pronged question. One, 
Do you think that's the case or does it oversimplify the amount of work that this new governing coalition has ahead of them? And two, what are the implications of this for EU relations with Hungary, since Poland has largely been the EU buddy backing Hungary up when EU's tried to crack down on what they call rule of law issues or liberalism issues? Absolutely. I mean, you've already partially answered your own question in the sense that one, at the meta level, it is, he's absolutely been discussed as sort of a cure, cure-all figure. Uh, and two, that it's going to be more complicated. Um, I think in, in the, the short term, it's going to make things with the EU a lot smoother because, quite frankly, the EU has been putting its thumb on the scales in Polish politics for some time. Now, it has normative justifications for that. We can talk about those, right? Like defending democracy, rule of law issues, all these sorts of things. That's fine. Uh, and if you're a poll, you might accept that. You might even welcome it. Um, but the EU has not been neutral in Polish politics. And so we should expect, for example, that the EU is very likely to ease up its varieties of budget constraints uh, on Poland uh, fairly soon. Uh, there's a you know, maybe a 20% chance that they stay very harsh until they get some uh, real reforms and it's all sort of done by the book. It's much more likely that they're going to ease up as fast as they can. Uh, as sort of a carrot to once a new government is formed, and also to show good progress, right? Make it easier. Uh, one reason why this money matters is because uh, it's going to make the bud any future budget calculations easier. When you have billions of EU funds sort of rolling in, that's very helpful. Tens of billions. Uh, I think the withhold in the withhold uh, withheld money is something thirty six billion euro at the moment. That's right, and they actually they actually gave some to the current government. Uh, finally, or, or allowed it to be dispersed in part because the U.S. was starting to poke a bit, right? Because Poland is such a strong ally vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Ukraine situation. Um, so that was, uh, there was, there was allowed a little bit of a dispensation relative to Hungary, which has not received its disbursements. Uh, and it's still waiting on COVID funds, right? Um, so that's one, one, one element. We should expect much easier relations with the EU. There, we should also expect lots of sort of symbolic meetings, meetings with Ursula von der Leyen, meetings with the German Chancellor, meetings with Emmanuel Macron, all the big, the big players of EU politics. They, they're going to be shown laughing and agreeing to various things that were, were, had not been agreed to before. Uh, it, it doesn't mean it's not genuine. It is genuine, but it's also, there's also going to be very, very strong effort to help, help however possible. Uh, and, be and because there has been such a through line of um, Tusk and the, this broader coalition are the good guys, we want them to succeed. Peace is a bad guy, uh, a bad guy party. We don't like them. Uh, we think they're undermining democracy, all these sorts of things. So we should expect that from the on the EU side. Um, in terms of the broader international or well, rather in terms of the view regarding Hungary, uh, it's uh, very fortunate for Hungary that they have, uh, Orban has a bit of a consolation prize in uh, Slovakia. Uh, Slovakia uh, has Robert Fico as the once and future PM. Um, and he is also in this sort of illiberal cast of characters, a bit of a, you know, black sheep in the EU family. Uh, so he'll still be able to have meetings and show that he's not alone vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis Brussels uh, and the, the, the broader sort of, let's say, liberal establishment of the EU itself. Um, Poland is going to make, I'd be surprised, I'd, I'd be actually very interested to see how um, the new Polish government will play this, frankly, because they could, they could really try to thumb, nose, thumb the nose of, of Hungary. Um, that may or may not backfire. It, it kind of depends on what their own internal calculations are. And, and the fact that because we live in the real world, they will have to deal with the Hungarian government for the rest of their time in government. So there, there are reasons to not want to just cause trouble and make fun of people, right? But we'll see. I would be surprised if we didn't get a little, some of that. Uh, not having Poland, because Poland is a much more important country than Slovakia is. Um, not having Poland uh, on the side of Hungary for, let's say, various EU votes is, is very meaningful. Um, and we should expect, again, uh, that a core of EU states bring up issues that have been foreclosed, uh, in part because of the sort of the, the de facto Hungarian-Polish alliance. Wouldn't be surprised if there's another round of talks on migration, 
that align in the way Brussels would like it to be, as opposed to the way Poland and Hungary had wanted it to be. Um, but we'll see. There's going to be some hard issue areas. For example, the, the continued issue of grain is going to be a major concern. Um, the EU would like to pretend that it doesn't exist. Um, but there's a broader coalition in Eastern Europe that's very, very displeased about the Ukrainian grain dumping. So it's not just Poland, it's not just Hungary, it's also Bulgaria, it's Slovakia. Um, remember, the assumed new Polish government, majority government, has an agrarian political party inside it. That's if they were to pull votes um, on the uh, because of the grain issue, that would be disastrous, right? So there's going to be a lot of delicate balancing. Um, and it's again going to make this much much more difficult. But uh, I would I, I would say that we should we should see a little fire in terms of the rule of law stuff because that's something that Donald Tusk is personally very interested in. He's fully in that framework, that EU framework of you know Poland and Hungary are in violation of a variety of core tenets of the European Union, institutional ones, and so expect some very interesting uh, meetings uh, over the coming year on that guy. Uh, Professor Waller, we know that you have to run now, so we'll we'll let you leave. But uh, thank you so much for all of your comments, and uh, have a wonderful evening. Absolutely, thank you very much for having me on. And I'd be very happy to chat more in the future. Thank you. All right, folks, that does it for today's episode of Pin Drop. Thank you so much for tuning in or watching on YouTube. That's right, if you are listening to the podcast as normal, if you want to get a few edits and would prefer watching on YouTube for various reasons, you can check out our YouTube channel now, Pin Drop World News. I'm not going to spin the globe this week because technically we did that after the Nepal episode, but we will next be covering this country right here, Turkey, spelled a different way now than it used to be, but pronounced the same way according to the Turks. Now, we are also going on break for the season. We will be coming back later with season four of Pin Drop World News. That will be taking place starting in mid November, again, beginning with the country of Turkey. And we really look forward to serving you all with this new format. In fact, if you're listening on podcast, you can now catch all new episodes and content we produce as YouTube videos as well, with some light editing on my part. I am AJ Camacho, the executive producer and anchor of Pindrop World News. The chief producer of today's episode was Nicholas Castillo, and Diego Austin is our co-producer. Pindrop World News was created by Ian Kearns. Thank you.